Uh, why? You, you talked about PPL6 and that you got started with PPL6. We're on PPL21. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you've been in the business a while. Tell me why Quipper is important to you. Well, I, to me, Quipper is important to me because it's a, <coughs> well, it's not enough, but it is a funding stream. It's almost a, a dedicated funding stream to do coastal restoration. Um, I, it, it's important, and, and sometimes I, it's important, but I can't get nothing done to quibble that. But that's that's part of the process. I mean, if you look at the WVA and everything else that you got to go through, and then the, the, the agency's got to look at every aspect, science and technology and everything else, and make the decision whether one is good. You don't agree with it because it may not do your project, but Quipper is a good uh, a good program. What the only program that has a funding stream that can I mean, a dedicated funding stream that that can get restoration done. I think Quipper is a good good thing, and I, and I like working with Quipper. Uh, the agencies, uh, I don't agree with them all the time, but you know, I mean, that's a human nature. You can't agree with them all the time, but I think that uh, the agencies that that uh, that are within Quipper are are trying to do a good job and are doing a good job. Even the outreach people are doing a real good job. <laughs> I'm glad you think so. Um, if you could listen to the generations before you, you know, your grandfather, your great grandfather, and kind of remember what they told you about wetlands, what what do you remember from them about wetlands and why we should take care of them and things like that? I mean, were there messages that you got as a well, uh, my grandfather was a kind of, I hate to use the word because it's kind of controversial, but he was an environmentalist. He believed in, you know, a, a, those practices we do, and <coughs> those practices are now being used through NRCS and uh, with the, the Farm Bill, which is like pres prescribed burning and, and uh, you know, water management and things like that. Uh, they did that in those times, and they, they and like I was saying a while ago about the flumes, they built flumes to where they, they, they protected the marsh. The, the marsh wasn't just, water just going in and out at any time. So they, 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 uh, they taught us that, look, you have to be able to, you, you can't, and, and it might be wrong to say it, but you can't let Nature take its course when you have screwed with nature. And if you wouldn't mess with nature, I think it's the, yeah, that, the old say old commercial used to be "Don't fool with Mother Nature." Well, we have we have screwed around with the hydrologist so bad until in, if you don't manage it now, you're not going to save it. Uh, we have we have land that like the rainy rainy marsh, rainy autumn side in marsh. There's a, such an influx of tide going in, and tide coming out, with the with the uh, I guess you call that uh, tidal flux. That's the where your wetlands cannot grow the fisheries because the fisheries, the eggs or the juveniles go in there and they poof, they're going back and forth in and out. They need to stay in there until they grow to a certain age to be able to go out. But now. Because of this tidal amplitude, this tidal flux, they don't really stay in that. So you're not, you're not really growing your 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 uh, your fisheries like you should be growing. And unless it's kind of managed to an extent, it's you're not going to save it. Um. So tell me, you you I agree. We have to take care of all these things, and we have made some pretty big mistakes. So if you want to give advice to the next generation, I know you have children and grandchildren, uh, what's your advice to the generations after you? Well, I'm trying to get the next generation, and I, I'm making a little bit of progress to, to get involved. You got to look at your surroundings and look at the benefits, all that is back there. And look at the possibility if it's not there, what's going to happen? I mean, right here, 
Well, I lost my house. I, my, my house was totally destroyed. I had to rebuild, and I had to rebuild it 14 feet. Anyway, well, not now I have to build it. It's 12 feet at the time. Well, when Rita came, that was after Rita. When I came, I had six foot of water in this house. <gasps> Of course, they never got in the house right. because I was I built up. But that kind of tells you that I, I'll go back to where all Hurricane Alder, and we had this much water in the yard. And now I have 12, 14 feet for Rita. For Rita. We used to have protection out there. The marshes were there. Uh, we didn't have all these big old navigation channels bringing in water. Start looking at your surroundings and and visualize what what could happen, what 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 this is gonna look like in twenty years or thirty years, if nothing's done. So you need to be involved and keep abreast of what's going on. Um we're gonna show this video to people outside of Louisiana. But hopefully we'll get some people in the national audience to watch this. What do you want the nation to know? Well, as long as you don't uh, manipulate the reality of <laughs> what's going on in Louisiana, likes being done now, I, I, I think we need to show it to people outside of Louisiana. I'll give you an example of that. Whenever we were after reading, we were building, basically building ourselves. I had people from all over the United States come help me build, volunteer. And we sat on them down the bottom of that one day and a bunch of kids from, I believe they were from Washington. They started talking about, man, the gas prices, the heat and oil, and all this kind of stuff is, is go outrageous up there. I said, mm -hmm. And you know me, I can't, I can't miss an opportunity. I said, do you know why? Well, no. Well, I'm going to explain to you why. If you live in Washington, D.C., 41% of your natural gas well, that goes up there comes through that little place right down the road right now. And I said, it don't work worth a damn underwater. So whenever you look at supply and demand, when you can't get none up there, the price goes up. <coughs> Never realize that. So when they left, they said, "Well, what, what would, what kind of message would you like to send back to the people?" Over there? I said, "Just tell them that. Look, call your representatives and senators and all this kind of stuff, and tell them if something comes up about saving coastal Louisiana, tell them to go vote for it. Because this is what's happening down here. That's what I. Uh, that's what I wanted them to." take that back with them. And whether they did or not, I don't know. I hope they did. Yeah, I think well. if they did. <coughs> and every opportunity, and I come from all over the United States, different <coughs> states, and I, 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 I guess the passion I have for coastal restoration, I can't help but kind of relate that message, you know, some kind of message about we need to do something about coastal Louisiana. Well, I appreciate your efforts to educate not just the local people, but well, people around the nation. It's important. When I got involved with uh, uh, America's Wetlands years and years ago, uh, I, I, made, I attended a meeting in, what's the name, D uh, Phyllis? With Darrensburg? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. We were talking, I said, Phyllis, we got to educate our people before we try to educate other people. We got people right here that still consider that marsh uh, swamp, but no, it, it, no value, wasteland. Not realizing what the benefits you're getting out of that. Not so much personal benefits, but, but benefits for the economy and the ecosystem. What what that is? They don't. They, you got you, you got to put that in your even in your school curriculum. Uh, so that people understand that, hey, the importance of that. I get on my soapbox every once in a while, but you know, somebody, one of these days, somebody gonna kick it out from under me. But you know, it, it's, it's, and, and we're trying to do that. 
I serve on the Salt and Water Conservation District Board, and we have a conservation trailer that we go around teaching kids about how to, well, you, you met Mitzi. Yeah, it's uh, great. To, to try to show people what erosion is and what agriculture is and all this kind of, and we'd like to expand that. We'd like to rather get, again, it goes down to funding. You gotta get some funds to where you can continue doing that. I mean, we're gonna continue doing it to a certain level, but then to bring it to another level, maybe it's gonna take some more points to do it. Well, um, do you have anything, uh, we've had a nice visit, and uh, do you have anything else that you'd like to tell people before we? I, we just need to tell <coughs> people to, to, to get involved, to get involved, and, and whether they get involved through Quipro or they get involved through any kind of legislation that's coming through that's going to help coastal Louisiana, they need to be involved. Contact their senator, contact their representative to see if that's something they can do to, to get the funding or get the involvement of the public into it. Uh, we, we've been trying to get hurricane protection into Million Parish for years, and we had town hall meetings to <coughs> But people want to know what you're going to do. Well, this is what we're going to do. They say, well, how are you going to pay for it? And the first time you bring up the word TAX, the ropes come out. And they start hunting for an oak tree. <laughs> so, you know, and, but people don't realize that involved in the Quipper process or in all the other restoration pro uh, programs is there's a cost share element in it. And if you don't go have the cost share, your project ain't gonna go through. Same thing with uh, if the, in the event the federal or state government builds you hurricane protection, after it's built, maintenance and operation falls on the parish. Who is gonna pay for that? Somebody's gotta come up with the money. But people don't realize that. They say, oh, the government's gonna do it. The government, well, sure, they may do it. But it's going to still cost you something down the road, and you're going to have the money to do it. And if you can't prove that you have the funds to do it, you ain't going to get it done to start with. So it, it's just get the people, get that mindset that it, this is not a gimme program. This is not a welfare program. That you got the help is there, but you're going to have to help yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you spending some time this morning. Well, I hope I didn't lead nobody astray. But uh, Oh, you didn't. <laughs> it's been great.